Unions always have reasons why taxpayers must pay. But why do government officials agree to the deal? Unions do what unions do. If you're dumb enough to negotiate the stupid deals that the MTA management has negotiated, then shame on them. Most of those elected officials don't know how to read a balance sheet. They're just not equipped to manage the process of managing 22 million people who work in the public sector. Some who were equipped didn't seem to care. After all, the pension bill won't come due until later. The person who did it 15 or 20 years ago is long gone. The council or the congressman or the senator. So we have, in effect, a crimeless victim. The victim is the taxpayer. But nobody really committed a crime. We won! And the political machinery perpetuates the scam. Politicians give workers raises and then the workers campaign for the polls. It's a money pump. It goes from the taxpayer to the public employee to dues to the union, from the union to the, to the candidate who will promise round to do more round. for the public sector employee. It's crazy. Even popular politicians cannot break the cycle. When Arnold Schwarzenegger tried, he was met with this. Arnold, Arnold, shame on you! And cuts didn't happen. The legislature has decided it is more important to protect state employees. California now has a $19 billion deficit. Were the state a private company, it would be bankrupt and replaced by more efficient competition. But most government workers don't have competition. In the private sector, there are no monopolies. So if somebody overpays, overpromises their workers, they go out of business. Yes, they do. But in government... We don't have a choice of saying, we're going to have someone else be our police department or someone else be our fire department. Union benefits are so good that in Miami, thousands lined up to apply for fire department jobs. Some camped out for two days. A few towns have escaped the money pump by privatizing public services. These workers fixing streets and picking up trash in Sandy Springs, Georgia. Gee, aren't they working fast? These workers work for a private company, and they get more work done in less time. We have fewer employees than the city to the north of us, and we have exactly the same population. The mayor, it's just coincidence she looks like Margaret Thatcher, started privatizing her town's government work five years ago. Some in town were not happy that their tax money was becoming some company's profit. And I say... What difference does it make if the company is making a profit, but you're getting a service that costs you less? We've got 18 cameras that we currently have on Roswell Road. At the traffic management center, they have computers and cameras. And car fire. So when a car catches fire, they send out rescue vehicles right away. We try to find the problems before anybody's actually calling us with it. Our government is more efficient. This realtor was amazed at the difference. Five or six miles of new sidewalks installed. Our traffic lights are synchronized now, so there aren't traffic jams. We had a survey done asking the public, how do you feel about each of these services? And the answers came back 90%. Very good, excellent. But Sandy Springs is an exception. Most cities and states are still at the mercy of public sector unions and the debts keep adding up. So far, America's been able to pay the bills. But one day, the parasite gets so big that there is no host anymore, and then they both die. And we're heading in that direction now. When we return, the battle over the pie. Are you getting your fair share? Oh, do you smell that fresh baked pie right from the oven? Do you like a piece? Which of you gets a big piece? Progressives say one thing wrong with America is that rich people keep too much pie. They cheat the middle class and poor out of their fair share. The rich sure do take home lots of pie, but does that really hurt the poor? If this represents the wealth of America, progressives would say the rich take so much that the poor just get a sliver. After all, as the movie Wall Street says, It's a zero-sum game. Somebody wins, somebody loses. Money itself isn't lost or made, it's simply uh, transferred. 
And that's a mistake a lot of people make, says Congressman Ryan. And so it's government's job to s divide up the slices of the pie versus having a society that grows the pie. A society that grows the pie. What a concept. And in fact, that's how it works in a free society because it's not a zero-sum game. The makers who get rich get rich by baking many more pies. Welcome to Mac World. Steve Jobs making billions doesn't leave the rest of us billions poorer. His new technology makes us all richer. We keep making it better and better and better. Rich capitalists are not evil. They grow the pie. It's why, despite recessions, the average American income has kept rising. Still, some rich people are very rich. The guy who owns this house owns a dozen others. Since our government's so deep in debt, shouldn't people this rich pay more? They should pay more. I mean, those who have more should pay more. Is there a point where the rich leave or stop producing wealth? Well, the rich have always cried wolf like that. You know, they always said, if we change this one bit, the country's going to go away, and that never really happens. But look at what did happen to Maryland's tax revenues when that state created a special tax on rich people. It was supposed to bring in $106 million. That's right. What happened? They lost $257 million. Surprise. So well, I'm surprised. Nobody should be surprised. This former Maryland governor, who's now running again, opposed the tax. They're always surprised, John. It reminds me of Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown was always surprised when Lucy pulled the football away. And they're always surprised in Washington and state capitals when the dollars never come in. Some of Maryland's rich people just left the state. They're out of here. These people aren't stupid. I've lived here all my life. New York billionaire Tom Golisano isn't stupid. He lives in that big house we showed you before. He made millions building this business, which processes paychecks for companies. I started with $3,000 and one employee. Then he created 13,000 jobs. But will they and he keep paying taxes here in New York State after the governor signed the tax increase? We increased the income tax for millionaires last year. Quite frankly, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, not that I like to throw the number around, but my personal income tax last year would have been $13,800 a day. Would you like to write a check for $13,800 a day to a state government, as opposed to moving to another state where there's no state income tax or a very low state income tax? He did also have this house in Florida. And moving to Florida, Zero. Zero personal income tax. And so he just moved. He now spends more than half the year in Florida. New York's governor says the tax increase was a mistake. And we projected that we'd get $4 billion, and we actually got uh, well short of it. It's just economics. People don't work to pay taxes. People work to get what they can after taxes. Art Laffer was an economic advisor to President Reagan. I mean, they'll change where they earn their income. They'll change how they earn their income. They'll change how much they earn. When they receive the income, they'll change all of those things to minimize taxes. But most of us won't. Most of us will just say, OK, I make a little bit less, but it's not enough to make me move or, or stop working. Well, maybe you, but I moved from California to Tennessee because of it. Donald Trump says, of course the rich will leave. What happens is they will leave the United States. I know these people. They're international people. Whether they live here or live in a place like Switzerland, doesn't really matter to him. You haven't left. I haven't left yet. Are you going to leave? Big story if I leave, I guess. If I leave New York, that's a big story. Look, the rich people are going to leave, and other people are going to leave. You're going to end up with lots of people that don't produce, and then that's the spiral. That's the end. So are we in a death spiral with no hope of return? No, say some. We can fix this. I'll show you their plan when we come back. Is America going to hell in a handbasket? Will government feed the takers until the makers are crippled? That's been the trend. But now there's something new in the air. You work for us! You work for us! For the first time since the founding of the Republic, people are visibly mad. They're pushing back against the growth of government. For good reason. The interest in our debt alone will soon eat our future. 
I mean, we've got all these time bombs built into these programs, and they will come due, and they will crash the economy. We've got to correct them. But politicians promise to protect the spending. I will protect Medicare. Republicans, too. It's going to cut Medicare for our seniors. But occasionally, a politician says, enough. I have vetoed the budget. When Gary Johnson was governor of New Mexico, he kept saying no. I vetoed half of the legislative product. They must have hated you. They did. They did. A fellow Republican called him ignorant of the political process. One of my veto messages was, I'm vetoing this piece of legislation because it's just way too long and we don't even understand what it says. After all these vetoes, New Mexico must have collapsed in, in a heap of misery and poverty. No, what you would think is you've got to sign these bills to get reelected. I vetoed all these bills and I got reelected. Reelected by a wide margin while criticizing government. Man is superior to government and should remain master over it, not the other way around. Voters seem to like that. But much of the political class didn't. And Johnson vetoed even nice-sounding bills, like what does he have against child care? Establish a pilot program allowing the state to reimburse grandparents who take care of children in welfare families. <laughs> pilot program, I think, is the key, the key word there. Pilot program sounds good. We're going to test it before we fund it. The agenda was really about growing government, about spending more money, and really not making a difference. Come on, guys. But always spending more. I vetoed a dog and cat exercise bill. And this was a Republican bill, but for my signature, it would have been law in New Mexico that pet stores exercise their dogs and cats two hours a day, three times a week. I signed that piece of legislation. I have to then establish the dog and cat exercise police. Well intentioned, but come on, where does government end and where does personal responsibility begin? The founders knew government should end at keeping the peace and enforcing contracts and property rights. Limited government leaves people free to pursue their own dreams, and that's worth fighting for. We're in a fight up here, uh, not over ideas, over an idea, which is the American idea, built upon the founders' principles. And when he sees the Tea Party protests and entrepreneurs overcoming obstacles, he believes the American idea will prevail. And that's why I'm really optimistic about this. I think we're going to turn this thing around. And that's the same reason Art Laffer can talk about entitlements and still look cheerful. Why can you smile when we're going to hell? Because I think we'll reverse it. Once you get to this position of a low rate, flat tax, spending controls, turning all those programs into defined contribution plans, privatizing all of these assets, selling off Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, selling off GM, selling off Chrysler, selling off AIG, you can bring the fiscal situation back into control pretty quickly. You'll get such economic growth that you'll have huge increases in revenues. We can really change America and make it back into the dream that we all really hope it will be. I mean, we can do that. I hope he's right. And that's our program on the battle for the future. I'm John Stossel. Good night. <laughs>